when FDR passed away, Harry Truman walked into the White House, and Grace Coolidge, who happened to be a Republican, sent a lovely letter to the Democratic Bess Truman explaining what she had been through. And that happened again in history, and once again, crossing political lines, Jackie Kennedy also sent a beautiful letter to Nancy Reagan when there was an assassination attempt on President Reagan's life. And there are a few first ladies that were really very, very close and visited with each other, wrote each other letters all the time, saw each other in Washington, and that's these ladies right up here. Bess Truman, Eleanor Roosevelt, and Edith Wilson. Women that had friendships for many, many years to come. And I will also share with you this young lady right here, Lady Bird Johnson, which by the way, does anybody know what Lady Bird's first name is? Claude, good for you, that's great. Many people don't know that. When I ask that question and people kind of look at me strange, I go, do you really think her mother named her Lady Bird? Okay. Well, as it turns out, Lady Bird happens to be one of our most popular first ladies with her sorority sisters. She was constantly going across political lines, making friends with all of the other senators' wives. And many first ladies had a great laugh with her. You can see this particular one. I wish I knew what Barbara and Lady Bird were talking about that day, but unfortunately I don't. And I couldn't come back to the Lincoln Library. I do have to share with you. Last time I was here, Dr. Cornelius, he was a gracious, gracious man. He was kind enough to take me down into the archives and took me into the vault. And he opened up, he was showing me a handwritten letter from Mary Todd Lincoln. Can you believe this? Mary Todd Lincoln wrote that letter. And I was asking him, well, how is it? Why is it that she's writing this this way and this across the top? Well, he explained to me at that particular time in history, it was the recipient who paid for the postage. So if you were a gracious hostess, you didn't want to stuff the envelope with a bunch of extra papers. So if you had any little room at the top, you would write it across the top. I thought that was remarkable. And as I mentioned to you, whenever I come to presidential libraries, I always bring my grandchildren something. Well, my grandson, who wanted to know where I was when Lincoln passed away, by the way, he was really into baseball, he loved baseball. So I got him a baseball with the president's signatures on it. And I got my granddaughter a cookbook because she was into baking cookies. I thought they would be thrilled. What did Nana know, right? Well, my granddaughter came up, she gave me a big hug and kiss and said, oh, Grandma, I'm so excited. She said, I'm going to make all these cookies and I want you to be there with me. Well, my grandson, who's normally a real love bug, he kind of strolled up, took a look at me, tapped me on the shoulder and said, thanks, Nana, and walked back. And I was devastated. I said, Jeremy, what's the matter? You don't like the baseball? He said, no, the baseball's okay, Nana, but I wanted the letter. Why didn't you bring home the letter? Because I was telling him all about it. Well, my daughter, who was over in a corner, and I looked at her and said, you think they're not listening to Nana, right? You think this history is just boring, right? He was 10 years old at the time. He wanted that letter. I did ask Dr. C Dr. Cornelius if, in fact, I could take that letter home to him, uh, but not a chance. No, absolutely not a chance. But never hurts to try. Tonight, I am not going to speak about Mary Todd Lincoln, and I hope that doesn't disappoint too many of you, but I make it a policy. I've had the great honor of speaking at five different presidential libraries, and it seems kind of silly to me to come to a presidential library where you have all of the experts here, and many of you in the audience are docents. You have an, all the information that you could possibly want to know about Mary, but I thought I would show some pictures for a few of you that may not be docents of uh, Mary Todd Lincoln, and a few that I don't know if you've even seen. Of course, we know that there is no picture of Mary and Abe in the same photograph. We know that that's true. But this particular one over here, evidently it was photoshopped together. So it kind of appears there in the same picture. And of course, we know about her children, that whatnot, Robert, her only surviving son. This hap whoops, pushing the wrong one again. This happens to be the very first picture we have of the White House. It's the very first known picture that we have. It happened to be during Abraham Lincoln's time. And what you see on the front lawn there happens to be a statue. It was Thomas Jefferson sitting on a big horse. I don't know whatever happened with the statue, but it's not there anymore. And of course, the famous picture of Abraham Lincoln who seemed to tower over all of the other men around him. And of course, we know that the North and the South, you know, Mary seemed to be the scapegoat for everybody during the Civil War. And I thought you might like to see this picture. I love to get actual photographs. And if you can see, 
this gentleman right there, that is Abraham Lincoln, and that, of course, was during his second inauguration. And many, of course, uh, know about Elizabeth Keckling, who was the seamstress for Mary Todd Lincoln. And I have in my own personal library about 250, maybe 300 books on America's First Ladies. Well, I happen to have signed all my books also. I understand Mary signed all of her books as well. This happens to be the inside of her book where I signed it with my name and a picture of her later in life. And of course, she wrote a story her story about Mary Lincoln that I thought was absolutely fascinating. Many people have not seen that book, so I thought you might want to see the inside cover of it. And of course, what Mary looked like when she was a young girl, as well as in her widowhood, and her signature. And this happens to be a picture of when Mary wanted to sell, you know, after she left the White House and she was trying to raise money, they were going to have an exhibition and sell her clothes in New York. Well, there wasn't much of a sale. She didn't make any money from that. We do know that she carried a lock of Abraham Lincoln's hair with her at all times. And this is a photograph that I wasn't sure many people had seen. Can you see this part right here? Okay, isn't that amazing? Okay, it was called a spiritual photograph, and there was only one photographer that did it at the time. In fact, he was brought up on charges, as a matter of fact. They were trying to literally put him in jail, but nobody could figure out how he got that photograph to look like that. And evidently, he wanted Mary to know that Abe was with her at all times and standing by her side. And this picture I thought would also be very interesting to you. We do know that Robert... Lincoln, of course, the gentleman that survived, the only surviving son of the Lincolns. Well, he lived to sit through numerous presidencies, and this happened to be at the opening of the Lincoln Memorial. He had the opportunity to be there, and I thought you might want to see a picture here of the sitting president at that particular time, Warren Harding, and a former president who was a Supreme Court Chief Justice, and that's William Howard Taft. So I thought that was a pretty remarkable picture. Can you imagine having a statue of your father put together like that and you having the opportunity to be there? I mean, these are things in history that we just cannot uh, duplicate. And I thought that was pretty remarkable. So that was it on uh, Mary Todd Lincoln. But I want to share some great stories and go into some detail with you about some of our other first ladies. And I don't know if many people recognize this young lady. Her first name was Frances. And I'm going to hold off telling you her last name right now because I think you might guess who it is. Frances happened to be our youngest First Lady. She was only 21 years of age when she went into the White House. Well, it turns out her father, who happened to be an attorney, and he had a law practice with a partner, he mentioned to his law partner, by the way, if anything should happen to me, please take care of my wife and my daughter. It's so important to me. And this gentleman was around when Frances was born. So he literally knew her from her birth. And he said, of course I will. And they became very, very close. She used to call him Uncle Cleve, and he used to call her Frankie. He sent her flowers on her birthday. He made sure she went off to college. And sometime during those college years, the relationship went from a little bit more than Uncle Cleve and Frankie. But I will tell you as well, there was never a time when they were together during their courtship years, I will say, that Fran Francis's mother was never there. She was always along on all of the dates. So I don't want anybody to think that this gentleman was with this young lady by himself. Has anybody got a clue what this young lady's name is? Cleveland, very good. This is a fantastic audience here. And if those of you think that politics today is really nasty and it wasn't so much back in the day, well, I'll tell you, it truly was. This happens to be an actual cartoon it was before Grover Cleveland was elected president. His opposing uh, party found out that there was a woman who had a child out of wedlock. Now, back in that day, that was a very embarrassing thing. You didn't want to share that. Well, as it turns out, there were two other gentlemen seeing this same woman. Well, Grover Cleveland, being the honorable man that he was, he was the only single man seeing her at that time, he stepped up and accepted fraternity. 
Well, the opposing political party basically ran this cartoon thinking this was going to absolutely squash his presidency. And the cartoon reads, of course, Ma, Ma, where's my pa? And what do you think Grover Cleveland's handler said after he won the presidency? Ma, Ma, where's my pa? Went to the White House, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> so once again, politics wasn't any dirtier today than it was back in the time. And Frances Cleveland, as I mentioned to you, was our youngest first lady. She was only 21 years of age. And Uncle Cleve, who she developed this wonderful relationship with, Grover Cleveland, was 49. Now, ladies, I don't know about you, but my mother would never have approved of that. <laughs> and yet Frances's mother did. Of course, it was a big affair when he decided he was going to marry Frances. He was already president of the United States. Frances is the only first lady to be married in the White House. There are two other first ladies that married a sitting president, but they did not get married in the White House, Julia Tyler and Edith Wilson. And this happened to be a picture that we were showing in the paper at the time. This, of course, is Frances's mother. And this was Grover Cleveland's brother. I remember the very first time I looked at it, I thought, my goodness, which one is the groom? <laughs> they look so much alike. But that was the brother. It was Grover Cleveland who went ahead and sent out the invitations. It was really a very private affair. He only sent out 35 invitations to very, very personal close friends and close guests. And the country absolutely loved Frances. They would copy Frankie's hairstyle. They tried to copy her clothes, a little bit of like what they do today. And some people say this isn't fair, but I couldn't resist. This is a picture of the man that Frankie fell in love with and a picture of the man that she married. I know that's not really fair, but it happens to be a true picture, right? It really was a great love affair. And Frances always said, by the way, that she always wanted to come back to the White House. This happened to be a picture of the second time she came back to the White House. Grover Cleveland is our only president to serve two non-consecutive terms. He was our 22nd and our 24th president. And when she left the White House, she told the staff, or supposedly the story goes, that she told the staff, keep this house exactly as it is because we're coming back one day. And sure enough, they did. And this happens to show you a picture of the other cabinet wives. And you can get an idea of the age difference between some of them. Um, <laughs> I have to be reminded, those were the days when you had to sit still for a very, very long time. You know, you couldn't take an instant picture. Because I looked at some of these ladies and I thought, they don't look particularly happy, do they? Right? Well, it wasn't because they didn't like Frances. They really did like Frances quite a bit. She was a very gracious woman. And when she came back to the White House, by the way, the second time, she came back with her daughter, Ruth, and she was pregnant with her second daughter. And the country fell in love with Ruth. They loved her. Baby Ruth did this, and baby Ruth did that, and baby Ruth did the next thing. And you know where I'm going with this? They named a candy bar after her, right? The Baby Ruth candy bar. Well, I thought you might like to see this particular photograph. As I mentioned to you, it really was a true love affair. Many people said that Francis only married Grover Cleveland because he was a big, powerful man. The truth is, she really did love him. They were married for 17 years. They had five children together. You'll notice in this one particular picture, there's only four. And that's because baby Ruth passed away, which was very sad. She was about 13 years of age. And that's one of the reasons why she's not in that particular photograph. And Frances Cleveland was our first first lady to remarry. She set the precedent that Jackie Kennedy went ahead and followed. She waited five years. And you can imagine, she was really a very, very young woman when Grover Cleveland passed away. So she went ahead and remarried. There was a time, and there was a story, by the way, when she went to the White House. This was a number of years later. And it was Dwight Eisenhower, who was president at the time. And of course, the president always likes to introduce people and talk with them like they know them exactly. And he was introduced to Francis, and of course he had no idea who she was. By this time, she was an older woman. And he smiled at her and said, and where did you live when you lived in Washington, DC? <laughs> and she smiled at him and said, in your house. <laughs> the president was said he was so furious that the individual that didn't introduce him properly, there's, there was rumors that they fired that person, but I'm not so sure that that's particularly true or not. But wonderful, wonderful stories about Francis. 
And I wanted to share another great story with you about a wonderful woman. Many people do not even recognize the name, Carolyn Harrison. Carolyn was a young girl. Her father was a minister as well as a teacher. And Carolyn was 15 years of age, and there was a 14-year-old boy that was coming around the house all the time. Well, it turns out he happened to be a student of her father's. And he'd constantly come by the house, and he'd say to his professor, you know, I want to study up on this, or I have a question about that, or I have something else. And it took her father a little bit, but then he finally figured out this young man was coming by the house so often, not because he wanted to do well in his studies, but because he wanted to see Carolyn. <coughs> Excuse me. And that gentleman's name was Benjamin Harrison. Do you recognize the name Harrison? Turns out his grandfather, William Henry Harrison, was our ninth president. Ninth or tenth? I think I said that wrong. No, he was our ninth. Excuse me. He was our ninth president. He was president for the shortest amount of time in history. It was only 30 days. And why is that? Well, Washington wasn't any warmer back then than it is now. He gave the longest inaugural address in history. It lasted an hour and 45 minutes. The president caught a cold, cold went into the flu, flu went into fever, he passes away 30 days later. At that particular time in history, there was never a vice president that succeeded to the presidency, and it took a horseman two days and two nights to ride to the vice president's plantation in Virginia and knock on his front door and say, Mr. Vice President, you need to get to the White House. That was our first president to die when he was president of the United States and it happened to be Benjamin Harrison's grandfather. Well, Benjamin Harrison was madly in love with Carolyn. He spent a, every waking minute he could possibly spend there. Remember, he was a year younger than her. And back at that time, you only got married when you could afford to support your family. Now, isn't that a novel idea, right, ladies? But, I mean, gentlemen, that is the truth, right? When you could afford to support a family, that's when you married. Well, of course, Benjamin, being a little bit younger and having law school to go through and whatnot, he couldn't support a wife for quite some time. And he w thought it was going to be a number of years before he married Carolyn. But he just couldn't wait. And when he was 20 years of age, Carolyn was 21, he pleads to marry her. He asks her father for her hand and says, I just, if you don't let me marry your daughter now, I will never marry her because I will not live another year. Talk about a little, you know, melodrama, okay? But he was 20 years old. We'll give him credit for that. They did get married. And as you can well imagine, they were quite poor, okay? Quite poor. They didn't have, uh, Benjamin was still, you know, just starting up his law practice. He said, of course, they weren't going to start a family for quite some time. He had his first child before he was 21 years of age. And for a number of years, they were constantly borrowing money, borrowing money, living on this borrowed money because they were just young kids when they got married. But Benjamin always said, when I make it, I will share it with the rest of the family, and I promise I will do good. And the gentleman did. And I thought you might want to see the home he built for himself. This happened to be after the Civil War which he did go off to the Civil War. Many of our presidents, by the way, served in the Civil War. And by this time, he was earning a whopping $10,000 a year, which was an absolute fortune. And he built this wonderful mansion that cost just under $25,000, which is about the cost of, what, a garage nowadays? I'm not sure if you can even build a garage for $25,000, at least in California, where I'm from, anyway. Um, and this happened to be the house that he would constantly campaign from when he was running for the presidency. And they used to call that back then uh, front porch campaigning. And what did you do? The gentleman would come out and stand on the front porch, and people would come listen to them. And they would tell their story of what they you know, wanted to do for the country. Well, there were so many people that would come to hear Benjamin's speeches and talks and whatnot, Carolyn said before the election, she said, well, it's one of two things. It's either the White House or the Poor House, because there were so many people that had gone through their home. There wasn't a blade of grass that was still alive at that particular time. Their fence had been knocked down. People were coming into the house. Furniture was getting broken. Carolyn said, well, it's either the White House or the Poor House for us. And as it turns out, they did go to the White House. And she was quite surprised when she got to the White House to find the White House was in very, very poor condition.
and she brought a rather large family with her. What you see in this picture is her daughter. She came with her daughter and her daughter's husband and two children, and they lived in the White House with them, as well as Carolyn's son. She had a married son that had one daughter at that particular time. They came quite frequently to stay at the White House for long extended periods of time. Carolyn's niece came to the White House and stayed there for a while. If I happen to forget to mention the niece, remind me, because there's a story about that. And as it turns out, the White House is literally falling apart, literally falling down. Carolyn moves in with this large family. Oh, and her 90-year-old father is also living with them in the White House. Well, it turns out there were rats literally all over the second floor. And she, we know this because she wrote it in a letter once, that the rats were so bold that they were running all around on the second floor, and they even got up on top of, and she mentioned this gentleman's bed. It turns out he was the private secretary to the president. And she said, we had to hire a man with a ferret to come in and clean all of this up. Well, I, I can't imagine going to the White House and finding uh, rats running around, but it was. And Carolyn was a wonderful, wonderful first lady for a number of reasons. Number one, she was well-educated. She was a little bit older when she became first lady, so she had a little bit more self-confidence than some of our younger first ladies. She loved music. She played the piano. And she was a wonderful artist. And what did she paint? But she would paint China all of the time. She would do the paintings on China. Well, there was many times that she would try to raise money for charity events. She was very involved in church events. And when people would say to her, Carolyn, you know, would you paint some china for us? Let us sell it and raise money for the church and whatnot. Carolyn said that was a wonderful idea. And when she became first lady, something else that she came up with was this is probably the first time somebody put a recipe book together. She thought that was going to be a great idea, and she asked some of the senator's wives if they would send in their favorite recipes, and she put this book together. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of pictures of Carolyn Harrison, but we do have this one, and it pretty much looks like her first lady picture. Well, I mentioned to you that the White House was absolutely falling down at that particular time, and Carolyn had a wonderful idea. She wanted to redo the White House, and she wanted to make it literally an absolute mansion. Well, you know, something that the president could be proud of. And she had these plans all drawn up. She was, oh, goodness gracious, here I go again. She was going to have the center of the White House, and then on each side, it was her idea to come up with an east wing and a west wing, and she was going to have a, basically a museum on one side of the house. Anyway, they were lobbying Congress. Well, of course, Congress didn't think this was a fabulous idea. He liked the idea with the ferrets coming in, taking care of the rats, but not so much this. But Congress did approve a $35,000 allocation for her to redo the White House. Now, $35,000 went uh, quite a ways, but not quite as much as Carolyn wanted. And what the White House looked like in Carolyn's day is it was the first time in history they had electric lights. See that up there? It was wonderful electric lights. These are her grandchildren again on the front lawn. Supposedly, this is a picture of the president and the first lady on the balcony there. Well, of course, Carolyn couldn't do a whole lot with $35,000, but she did do something that was rather important. I mentioned to you there was this large family of hers that she came in with her daughter and her, the grandchildren and her son. And there was one bathroom in the private quarters upstairs. Only one. Carolyn made sure that a bathroom got put in for every bedroom that was upstairs. Now, this is a woman who's thinking practical, right? They redid the, the kitchen as well, that downstairs in the kitchen. They did the heating. And the big thing about the electric lights is the head usher uh, was responsible for turning them on and off. And that was because the first lady and the president were terrified they were going to get shocked if they turned the lights on. Well, if I Coover, who happened to be the head usher at that particular time, if he left early that day or didn't come in a particular day, the lights stayed on for 24 hours because no one would turn them on or turn them off. They were so frightened of that at that particular time. And, of course, I thought you might want to see what it looked like, the first telephones in the White House. And I'm trying to picture all of these cords hanging up here and hanging around. I thought it was a great picture. 
as I mentioned to you that Carolyn was a remarkable first lady, she was the one that made the comment that we have within ourselves, and you'll see it up there on the screen, the only element of destruction, our foes are from within, not without. And she truly believed in that. And one of the things that she did herself was, because she was raising money for different charity causes and whatnot, John Hopkins Hospital came to her and said, Carolyn, will you raise money for our hospital and for our medical school? And Carolyn said, yes, I will, on one condition. And what do you think that condition was? That you admit women at the same time that you admit men, that with the same conditions, which I thought was absolutely a wonderful thing to do. She was also the first President General of the Daughters of the American Revolution. She's the first First Lady to have written the speech and gave the speech, and that was, of course, when the DAR first opened up. She thought it was so important that the women of the American Revolution get acknowledged. Um, I oftentimes say, we had some wonderful, wonderful gentlemen at that particular time, George Washington, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, but if it weren't for the women, if it weren't for Martha Washington and Abigail Adams, I wonder if those guys could have really done that job. I mean, do you think so? They got a tremendous amount of support. Well, the sad story about Carolyn is, and she'll probably get lost in history, because Frances, the first lady that came just before her, who was very young and very popular, happened to be the first lady that came after her. So she was kind of sandwiched in between this young woman turns out Carolyn dies in the White House. She's not the first First Lady to die in the White House, but she does pass away. And it turns out it's a time in history when her husband is running for re-election, and who is he running against but his old foe, Grover Cleveland. But his wife is quite ill. She is dying. Benjamin Harrison just really doesn't have it in his heart to do any kind of campaigning. And I mentioned to you that Grover Cleveland was a very honorable man. Because Benjamin Harrison stopped campaigning, so did Grover Cleveland. It was probably the most civil election in all times, because he didn't campaign. But as it turns out, Carolyn was the one who said, you know, all of this wonderful china that we have, she found great pieces of china downstairs in the basement. She started the very first china collection. And it happens to be one of the most favored spots on the tour. If you go to Washington, D.C., well, maybe not so much today because they're not having tours today, uh, but that's another story. Um, but if you do go to Washington and you go on the tour, you will see the China Room. And of course, this is what it looks like today. Carolyn was also the first First Lady to bring the uh, Christmas tree into the White House. So there were a number of firsts during Carolyn's time. And as I mentioned to you, I want to share a story with you about the niece but I thought you might want to see some of the china from some of our former first ladies. And of course, oops, goodness gracious. There you go, this one's Carolyn's. And of course, got Mary Todd Lincoln's over there and Nancy Reagan. I mentioned to you about this niece. Well, the reason why this niece came to the White House is because her aunt, Carolyn, was quite ill and she couldn't keep up with all of the activities and whatnot. Well, as it turns out, the niece and her husband, Benjamin, become very close. She used to take long walks with the president. She used to share stories with the president. And of course, when Carolyn passes away in the White House, it only seems natural that the president and his niece, or his wife's niece, became very, very close. Well, it turns out a number of years later, Benjamin Harrison marries this niece. Now, he has two children of his own. He has two, grand, or two grown adult children. They were so appalled that their father married this younger woman, they refused to attend the wedding, absolutely refused. Well, they also had a child together, and this child was younger than Benjamin Harrison's four grandchildren. Are you ready for that? I mentioned this to my husband one day, and I just looked at him and said, don't even think about it, okay? We're not going there. And I wanted to talk, talk with you about another First Lady, Mamie Eisenhower, another remarkable woman. As it turns out, she came from a rather wealthy, wealthy family. Her father retired when he was only 35 years of age. Well, that's very, very young for retirement. He was a millionaire at that particular time. He owned a meat packing business. 
they had four daughters together, and they lived a very comfortable, comfortable life. Well, how comfortable was it? Mamie never made a bed. She never learned to cook. In fact, she said a number of years later, she really didn't regret never learning to cook. She said, if you don't learn, no one will ask you to do it. I thought, now that's a thought, right? You know, if you don't learn, they won't ask you to cook. Well, this cherished life that she had, many people thought that she was, of course, going to marry some society young men. Well, as it turns out, she falls in love with a military man. And who is that gentleman but Dwight Eisenhower, or as we called him, Ike Eisenhower. And I thought you might want to see a picture of them when they were quite young. Isn't that adorable? Mamie was quite the dresser, absolutely quite fashionable. She really didn't get recognition of it because, once again, it depends on who the first lady is before you and who the first lady is after you. When Jackie Kennedy came into the White House and she was so known for her fashion, people tend to forget that Mamie Eisenhower was really a fashion plate in her own right. And many people don't know this, but they also had a child before their son, John. And this child, l darling little boy, they used to call him Little Ike, and that soon became Icky, Little Icky. And uh, I can remember one time I had the great honor of speaking at the Eisenhower Presidential Library, and I asked them, why did they, what's with the Icky? <laughs> what's with that? And they said, well, some people said that his diapers were rather Icky, and so that's what that was all about. I don't know if that's true or not, but I thought, well, that's a great story. Well, as it turns out, just very shortly after Mamie gives birth to Little Ike, she catches pneumonia, and this was a very, very serious ailment back at that time because they didn't have antibiotics for it. And Mamie even said at that time, you either survived it or you didn't. Well, as it turns out, her husband was able to take a three-day emergency leave. He was able to come home, see his wife, who thankfully did, of course, survive, and see his son for the first time. Turns out, Icky passes away when he's only three years of age. And it was a very, very, very sad time in their history. Turns out, once again, Mamie happens to be quite ill, and so she cannot go in and see her son. And Eisenhower was the gentleman, of course, the father, and he was in there holding his son when his son passed away. And Mamie said, you know, we never really talked about it after that, but I could tell you it was a tragic, tragic time. And Dwight never, ever got over it. In fact, every year on Icky's birthday, he would send his wife yellow flowers because that was Icky's favorite color. And it didn't matter if he was off fighting World War II, it didn't matter where he was, he would go ahead and send his wife flowers. So it really does affect men as well. People oftentimes say that the presidents don't care when they send boys and women off to war. Well, they do. They care quite a bit. And I thought you might want to see this particular picture. When uh, I had the honor of speaking at the Eisenhower Library, and once again, they were very gracious. They took me downstairs, showed me the um, archives. Well, as it turns out, they open a cabinet, and this dress is the very first thing I see. And I went, oh my goodness, I, I, I remember that dress. I said, Mamie had a hat that went with it, right? And the curator said, yes. And did you know, and he opens a drawer, she had her shoes covered in that same fabric. So not only she had the hat and the shoes that matched, and of course, wonderful other pictures of her there. Quite, quite fashionable. And by the time they got to the White House, I love sharing this story with you. Of course, this happens to be a picture of their son, John, who, by the way, followed his father into the Army. He went into, was, uh, went into West Point when he was 18 years of age. And I used to say to my grandchildren, you know, when you're the first lady, you can pull some strings. And I said, this first lady pulled a great string. Look at this. Can you see that picture? Can you see who that is? OK. It turns out it's Roy Rogers. Very, very good. Well, when you're first lady, you can have Roy Rogers at your grandson's birthday parties, right, with Dale Evans. And it made me think of something. I'm searching here. I want to read something to you because I thought it was absolutely adorable, if I can find it. Ah, right. Okay, here we go. Um, and as it also turns out, not only did Mamie have Roy Rogers and Dale Evans at his son's or grandson's birthday party, but they have their own home theater. 
And I mentioned that to my grandson also. I said, by the way, when you come to Nana's house, there's no theater there, sweetheart. Okay, I just want you to know that ahead of time. Well, it reminded me, and I was once again sharing these stories with my grandchildren, trying to explain who Roy Rogers was. Well, he was a very famous cowboy, and you know, cowboys and Indians were really popular at that particular time. And cowboys were, you know, supposed to know everything and be the best. And I said, you know, there was another team that also came along. Do you remember the Lone Ranger and Tonto? Okay, come on, somebody's got to be my age out there, right? Okay, there you go. Well, I came across this joke, and I thought it was absolutely perfect. And it said, for those of you who think that the Lone Ranger was so smart, and it proceeds to say, the Lone Ranger and Tonto were out camping in the desert. And after they finally set up the tent, they were both men were terribly exhausted. They both crawled into the tent and fell fast asleep. Well, it was a couple of hours later. Tonto wakes up, and he turns to the Lone Ranger, and he says to him, Kimo Sabi, that's what he used to call him, Kimo Sabi, look up, what do you see? And the Lone Ranger looked up and he said, I see millions of stars. And Tonto says, yes, what does that tell you? And the Lone Ranger says, well, it tells me that, uh, let me see, uh, there are millions of galaxies and potentially billions of planets. It tells me that Saturn is in Leo. It tells me it's about a quarter past three in the morning. Tonto looks at him and says, you are as dumb as buffalo. And he said, well, I don't understand, Tonto. He said, what does it tell you? Tonto looked up and he said, it tells me somebody stole our tent. <laughs> so for those of you that said that the Indians weren't quite as smart, Tonto definitely was definitely as smart as the Lone Ranger. And Mamie Eisenhower, we talked about what a fashionable first lady she was. She, by the way, decided that she wanted to be buried in this particular gown. Can you imagine? I only wish that gown was at the Smithsonian Institution. Unfortunately, it went with her. And you might recognize the people that were also in this picture. You recognize? Pat Nixon and her daughter. Well, I mentioned to you that when Dwight Eisenhower was president, of course, you know, the president can do whatever he wants. Well, his grandson, who, of course, had this birthday party and saw all the movies in the White House, his name was David which, by the way, was Dwight's first name. His name was David Dwight Eisenhower, and he took his middle name. Well, he went ahead and decided to rename Camp David after his grandson. You know, when you're president of the United States, you can do almost pretty much what you want. He said, I'm going to name it after my grandson. Well, his vice president was Richard Nixon. Okay, remember that back in that time? Well, Richard Nixon had two lovely daughters. There's one of them. And... Turns out that the daughters and Eisenhower's grandson became very, very close and is, went together for a number of years, dated, and eventually married. So it turns out that Pat Nixon and Mamie Eisenhower were quasi-related to one another. And it turns out that when Mamie Eisenhower was elected, I shouldn't say she was elected, when President Eisenhower was elected president, the country was so much in favor of Mamie, they came out with these buttons that said, Mamie for First Lady. She was a lovely, gracious First Lady. The only thing the public had a hard time with, those bangs. Oh, yeah, take a look at those bangs. Well, and it turns out many people used to write to the White House and literally complain and say, why doesn't the First Lady change those bangs? She heard about those letters, and guess what Mamie said? I don't care, I like them. Okay, this was a strong woman. She also made the comment, I don't understand what women want to be liberated from. She thought it was very important to be, of course, the wife. And she also said that she never gave Eisenhower any advice. She said, I can row his own boat. I'm in charge of the house. He's in charge of everything else. And we get along just fine. Mamie had one major fear. And she dreaded the fact that she was going to look old when she got old. So she made sure she stayed young as she could and dressed as young as she could. You'll notice in this particular picture, as well as this one, their 50th wedding anniversary, she's still wearing strapless gowns. Now, we don't need to go into my life history, but I'm 60 years old, and I don't wear a strapless gown. Are you kidding? This woman had no problem wearing a strapless gown whatsoever, and I, of course, think she looked absolutely lovely at that particular time. She did grow old very graciously. And when she did pass away, 
And of course, they were going through her belongings. That's when she had written a note with which gown she wanted to be uh, buried in. They saw on her nightstand this picture. Now, her husband was president of the United States. He was president of Columbia University at one point. And yet, the picture that she has on her nightstand is still when he was the general. Well, this is even before he became general. She always saw herself as the general's wife. He, she said that she went ahead and made her bed and slept in it. And she said that because there were a number of times early in the marriage that she really wasn't sure that she could kind of go on. And the reason why she said that is Ike said to her right after they got married, Mamie, I'm going to tell you something, and I'm only going to say it to you once. And that is, my country comes first. You will always come second. Well, that was pretty tough, but Mamie said, OK. And she said all of the years that she was married to him, she tried her very, very best to have as much enthusiasm and support for the country as Ike did. And there were times when they were separated for long periods of time, particularly during war. And Mamie found herself quite lonely, quite sad. But she hung in there through it all. In fact, when her husband was general, and it was during World War II, she would not even go out to dinner with friends. And why was that? Well, first of all, Mamie did happen to like a cocktail, but she was not an alcoholic. Some people gave her that reputation because she stumbled periodically when she walked. Well, that was because she had an inner ear infection. And so she uh, sometimes stumbled, but it wasn't because she was drunk. And she used to say, if I go out with some girlfriends, even if I'm having just a glass of water, the newspapers are going to report that I have wine. They're going to say that I was drunk. And how awful is this that my husband is sending young boys off to war and his wife is out partying in Washington, D.C. So she stayed at home all that time, most of the time, by herself. Because once again, she was trying to match her husband's dedication and commitment to our country. Many people don't recognize the sacrifices that so many of the Army families make, as well as the individuals themselves that are in the Army, and the Air Force, and the Marines, and all of the others. So that was the picture that she always kept. She loved it. And I wanted to end today's program with the first lady that I had the great honor of meeting, and that was Nancy Reagan. Um, I do live in Southern California. In fact, I don't live terribly far from the Reagan Library. And I've had the pleasure of speaking there uh, about four or five different times. And Mrs. Reagan used to come by the library quite often. She doesn't quite so much now. And she was doing a book signing and um, was allowing to take pictures with people. Well, I waited in line patiently like everyone else did. And when I got up there, I handed her the book, which was my turn. She had just written. Of course, it was her autobiography. But I had another book with me. And that book was called Nancy. She had written that book when she and her husband, after they left the governor's mansion, they were governor of California. Ronald Reagan was governor of California. And Mrs. Reagan was so surprised to see that someone had that book that she, in fact, had written herself. She put her pen down, and she looked me square in the eye, and she said, where in the world did you get this? And I proceeded to tell her, of course, that I was a historian and how much I loved her history and whatnot. And I asked her to autograph it, which she did do. And I also thanked her for her say no on drugs. Um, at that particular time when she was in the White House, I had a teenage son living at home. And that was the best thing I could say at any time, was just say no. And uh, she was quite, quite gracious. She's a lovely woman. Every now and then, you'll see her on a lo the local news, uh, getting her hair done or getting her nails done. She is just very, very, very lovely. A little bit frail right now, but extremely nice. And I thought you might want to hear some stories about her when she was young. Do you love this picture? Is that adorable or what? I think that's absolutely precious. And that's not, not too far from what she looks like today. Well, Nancy Reagan grew up in a family where her mother, it turns out, was a stage actress. And her father, unfortunately, left the family at a when Nancy was very, very, very young. And so she really didn't know her dad very well. And she obviously didn't really like him that much because she didn't know him, and he was never around. Well, after he left, it turns out her mother goes back into stage acting because that was one of the ways she could support herself. And she left Nancy with 
relatives. And there was a period of time there, probably about three years, when Nancy only got to see her mom very, very short occasions. But it turns out they had a wonderful, wonderful bond together. She absolutely adored her mother. As she grew up, she decided she wanted to go off to college. She did graduate Smith's College. And of course, she herself became an actress. But before that, I thought you might want to see what Nancy looked like when she was a young girl with her mother, Edith Luckett picture of her there, and of course, as Nancy was an adult, and then when her mother was, of course, later in age. I just think uh, these pictures, to me, are just absolutely precious, with the hat and the fur and all of that stuff. Well, as I mentioned to you, Nancy went off to become an actress, and she thought she was going to be an actress for her whole life, although, you know, she wasn't sure she was going to get married. She was probably pushing 30 by the time she mar or met Ronald Reagan. And I thought you might want to see a couple of these pictures. Before she met Ronald Reagan, do you recognize this gentleman? That's Clark Gable. Yes, even Clark Gable couldn't impress upon Nancy. You know, Nancy always said, life began when I met Ronnie. And she really believed that. Here's a picture of her with Ronnie and Marilyn Monroe. Thought you might like to see that. Dean Martin. It was really the Hollywood set. And they did get married in a small little church. It was a very, very small, intimate wedding. And the best man, you recognize that gentleman? Who is it? William Holden. Very good. This is a fantastic audience. William Holden. And these, of course, were pictures of Nancy during her years. People oftentimes ask me, did she and Ronnie Reagan ever appear in a movie together? Nancy Reagan did appear in 11 movies, but only one of them with her future spouse, and that was this particular one, Hellcats of the Navy. Well, she knew the minute she laid eyes on Ronald Reagan that that was the man for her. Ronald Reagan took him a little, little while to come around, but once he did, of course, we know there was a tremendous love affair between the two of them that lasted throughout their entire marriage together. They did, in fact, have a family. And Nancy says in her own autobiography, the only thing that she wanted when she was a young woman growing up was to be a good wife and a good mother. And she said, I think I did better at the former rather than the latter. She said that there was just so much love between her and Ronnie. Sometimes even the children were pushed out of the way. Not that she meant it to be that way, but that's just because how it was. And here's the story. It's funny, uh, oftentimes when I put pictures up here, I try to get the year, so at least I have a sense of it. There was no year on this picture, but if that wasn't the 70s, do you remember, right? The 70s with the plaid coats and all of that other kind of stuff. Well, I mentioned to you about um, Lady Bird Johnson and what was her first name. Do you know what Nancy's first name was? Oh, I got gotcha. you. Ha, Anne Francis. Yes, her mother named her Anne Francis, and of course, when I was at the Reagan Library, I would ask the docents all of the time, why did they call her Nancy? And they said, well, it's because her mother liked the name. I said, well, she didn't like it enough to name her that, so why, why? But anyway, she did name her Anne Francis, and it worked out great, because when they lived in Washington, D.C., and her children were still living in California, when the White House would call, and of course, they'd want to get a hold of the children, if they weren't available right then and there, Nancy didn't want to say, you know, the operator say, you know, the White House is calling or the president is calling. So what do you think they said? Anne Francis is on the phone, right? Well, the kids always knew if Anne Francis called, you called her back right away because that was a very important person to them. And of course, we know that Nancy loved the color red. She really put that on the map. And she was an extremely stylish first lady. They said she was basically the Jackie Kennedy of the Republican set, as Jackie Kennedy was in the Democratic set. And she wore red quite often. But red wasn't the only gown she wore. We, she had many, many dresses. And I thought you might like to see this picture here of her dressed up as what we call secondhand rows. Every year in Washington, there is a press corps dinner where the press gets to basically um, make fun of the president. I guess that's the very best way to put it. Well, Nancy knew that many people used to refer to her as Queen Nancy. 
and you know she always wore designer gowns. Well, Nancy could laugh at herself, and at this particular dinner, she went in the back room, dressed up as secondhand Rose, and came out singing that song, and the press absolutely loved it. They said, you know, they understood why she was doing that, and Nancy came up to the podium, and she said, you know, I don't know why they call me Queen Nancy. She said, I would never wear a tiara. It would mess up my hair, for goodness sakes. So she had a wonderful sense of humor about it, but they did give her a really hard time about her china, which, by the way, was also red, as you might recall. And these are just some of the designer gowns that she wore and made quite famous. And as I mentioned to you, we talked about it being a genuine love story. Nancy Reagan did say that my life began when I met Ronnie. And how is it that she met Ronnie? Well, she was an actress at that particular time, and Ronald Reagan happened to be president of the Screen Actors Guild. Well, back in Hollywood, there was a big thing about communism, and they were saying that various actors or actresses, if they were part of the Communist Party, they weren't going to get jobs. Well, there was another Nancy Davis, it's her maiden name, and somehow this Nancy Davis got her name on this communist list. And Nancy was terrified. She thought she was never going to work again. And somebody said, well, we'll call Ronnie Reagan. You know, he's president of the Screen Actors Guild. He'll, you know, he'll straighten the whole thing out. So, of course, they get in touch with one another, and Ronald Reagan says to her, well, uh, I'd be happy to meet with you and talk with you about it, but I have an early morning call in the morning, so it's, it's going to be a, a you know, quick night. And, of course, Nancy didn't want to be, you know, imply that she didn't have a date. Either. She said, oh, I have an early morning call tomorrow morning, too. She said, so it'll be a very early evening. Well, at 3 o'clock in the morning, when they were still talking with one another, they admitted to each other. They both said that, just in case they didn't like one another. Nancy knew immediately that she liked him. And I can remember when I used to watch Nancy when she was first lady. Remember the gays? Okay. I, Barbara Bush, who I mentioned to you, had a wonderful sense of humor. Whenever Ronald Reagan was giving a speech, Nancy just, just gazed and just looked at him, just in awe. And Barbara Bush said, <laughs> there were a couple, she said, I've heard that speech a million times. She used to sit there and crochet. You know, literally, she said, I've heard this a million times. She said, and I thought, you know, I've never really seen any of Nancy's films, but she had to be one heck of an actress if she could look at Ronnie like that after years and years and years. But as it turns out, it really was a love story. She did love Ronald Reagan extremely. They were very intimate together. They shared everything. We know that particularly later in his presidency, Ronald Reagan became a little bit hard of hearing. So Nancy used to whisper things to him periodically just because he couldn't always hear some of the questions. And people said that Nancy was always telling him what to do. And that is not the case. She certainly had opinions, okay? And there were a couple times in his administration she did get a couple of people fired. Um, some people thought that Nancy Reagan was rather cold, okay, and reserved. Other people said that she was just a dedicated wife and very, very supportive. And I can tell you that's the Nancy Reagan that I had the honor of meeting. Very, very supportive. And I thought you might want to see this picture. Um, I, when I saw this first one in the middle here, it turns out there was a large picture of Ronald Reagan behind her, and this always reminded me of them. And why do I say that? Because in Nancy's mind, Ronald Reagan was just the you know, prince of all prince. He was the most remarkable individual she had ever met, and I always felt like he overshadowed her. She was truly, in her own right, a very remarkable person. And I will also tell you, because of the Ronald Reagan Library, Every year on Ronald Reagan's birthday, Mrs. Reagan goes to the library and spends a few quiet minutes with her husband. She just sits there quite patiently. The press finally stopped following her. They knew that every year she was going to show up. And uh, they finally, at one point, said, OK, we, we, we can stop taking pictures of Mrs. Reagan. We know she's going to be there. Well, I will tell you, I could go on and on. I was laughing and telling the people earlier, I didn't know how long you t they said the program was for. Because if anybody has questions for me, I can tell you I will be here all night answering them. I am going to go outside, autograph some more books for you. I want to thank you all so much for coming. And if you have any questions and anything, any little bits of gossip that you might want to know, be sure and bring them out to me, and I will answer those for you and autograph the books for you. And I want to thank you so very much for being so kind, so gracious, so supportive, and having me here today. Thank you so much. <laughs>